Want to speed up your language learning? Get access to all of our best PDF cheat sheets for free. Just click the link in the description and sign up for your free lifetime account right now. I will introduce a bit of the historical development of Dutch and German. Then, I'll give some background information on how the pronunciation of the languages grew apart. After that, I will go deeper into specific differences between Dutch and German. The first specific difference I will be discussing is the spelling and cases. The second specific difference I will be discussing is related to grammar. Before we jump in, a small disclaimer. I am fluent in German, but while learning German, I didn't quite get rid of my Dutch accent. So German audience, I'm sorry for butchering the pronunciation. Let's jump in. In ye good old times, around the time of the Roman Empire, the Proto-Germanic language was spread out north of the Roman Empire. Because when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Which, in this case, meant speaking Latin instead of the barbaric Proto-Germanic. North of the Roman border, so in Austria, Germany, the Netherlands, Denmark, and in part of Scandinavia, Proto-Germanic was the most important language. To the west, the Slavic and Uralic language sphere was situated. This is Finland, Poland, Hungary, down to the Balkans and east towards Russia. Now you know where the Proto-Germanic language sphere was located. So let's fast forward right to around the fall of the West Roman Empire. Around the fall of Rome is when the High German consonant shift slowly started to happen. This means that over the course of many generations the language changed. It took roughly three to four hundred years. However, the High German consonant shift did not happen in Low German and Dutch. Low German? Where did that come from? Let me explain. Because of the standardization of German, Low German slowly became a dialect after the High German consonant shift took place. The High German became the standard German. Low German is still spoken in the northern part of Germany, but the amount of speakers is dwindling. Just to clarify something about High German to avoid confusion. High German is called High German because it was spoken in the German Alps, up high. In German, it's called Hochdeutsch, which is also translated as Standard German. This may lead to some confusion, so make sure you have the right Hochdeutsch in mind when reading something on this subject. Low German is called Low German because it was spoken in the lowlands of German. To avoid confusion, in Germany they sometimes say Old High German to clarify which German they're talking about. Alright, the consonant shift takes place in four phases. Another three shifts happen which officially aren't categorized. Let's walk through them. The first phase saw three changes. The first one being that words ending with a P sound changed to a F sound. Let's look at the word ape as an example. In Dutch it's aap and in German it's affe. The second change was that the final T at the end of a word became a S or Z sound. To illustrate this, let's look at the word white. In Dutch it's wit and in German it's weiss. The third change was when the letter K was replaced with a CH sound. Take for example the word belly. In Dutch it's buik and in German bauch. The second phase saw two changes. The first one being where the P sound became a F sound. The word horse illustrates this point perfectly. In Dutch it's paard and in German it's fährt. The second change was with the letter T when it's not 
at the end of a word. It became a z or ts sound. For example, the word tooth. In Dutch, it's tand, and in German, it's zahn. In the southern Austro-Bavarian dialects, a third shift happened, but this one is not found in standard German. So that's a topic for another time. The third phase saw only one shift that affected standard German. The D sound at the beginning of a word became a T sound. Look at the word part. In Dutch, it's deel, and in German, it's teil. Two other shifts happened, but they were restricted to Swiss German and some Austro-Bavarian dialects. Let's keep moving. Whether the fourth phase is officially part of the high German consonant shift is a debate, as one part also affected low German and Dutch. This is the opposite of the first three phases, which solely affected high German. The three shifts include the th becomes a d. This shift also happens in Dutch and not in English. So bath in Dutch is bad and in German it's bad. The last three shifts happen somewhere, sometime along or after the high German consonant shift. The first one is like the other shifts mentioned before. The other two only concern the pronunciation of letters. The first one is that the th or v sound becomes a b sound. This can be seen in the word love. In Dutch it's liefde and in German it's liebe. The second shift, purely in pronunciation, is the g sound. In High German, they used to pronounce the G as in Dutch, the signature G sound. As Dutch was unaffected by this change, we still pronounce the words in the good old way. Take for example the verb to give. In Dutch we say geven and in German it's geben. The last one is that the S and the Z are pronounced as sh. Take for example the word weak. In Dutch it's zwak and in German it's schwach. The last one does get a bit vague as in Dutch we also know the sh sound. Take for example the word shield. In Dutch it's schild and in German it's schild. As I mentioned before, these changes started right from around the fall of the West Roman Empire and continued until somewhere in the 9th century, as then German was written down in books. This caused a degree of standardization of Old High German, which later became the Standard German. And that wraps up the phases. Having this shift in mind, you can see why German and Dutch are over 80% similar. Don't think that every word is similar though. There are a lot of false friends. The word winkel is such a false friend. If I say in Dutch, ik ga naar de winkel, I say, I am going to the store. If I were to literally translate that in German, it's something along the lines of ich gehe zum winkel. That will leave the average German puzzled. That is because in German, winkel means angle. And if you're saying you're going to the angle, that probably would raise some questions. So, you may be wondering what the other differences are. Because of the high German consonant shift, a lot of words are spelled differently. This is not where it stops, however, because German and Dutch spelling rules continue to differ on various other aspects. Here are three examples where spelling rules differ. The first one, the spelling rules for capital letters. Generally speaking, Dutch follow the same spelling rules as English, with the exception of months and days of the week. They're not capitalized in Dutch. 
German, on the other hand, capitalizes each and every noun. A second one is that in Dutch, non loan words never end with a double letter. For example, the verb to want in German is spelled as W I L L, while in Dutch it's spelled as W I L. Only one L. The third one is about plurals. Plurals are easy in Dutch. They either end in EN or with a S. In German, it's just a bit harder to grasp as nouns are declined in various different endings and the rules are harder to learn. Having three genders does not make it any easier. Does that mean that spelling rules in Dutch are way easier? Sadly, it does not. It is sometimes joked that Dutch spelling rules have an exception to the exception of the exception of the exception of the main rule. This partly has to do with the Taaluni. This is an organization created by the Dutch and Belgium government to govern the spelling of the Dutch language. In the Netherlands, the Taaluni is the only organization that can change the official spelling rules that is used by the government and is taught in schools. This high degree of standardization means that sometimes awkward spelling of words remain in place for a very long time. Before we move on with differences in grammar, I'll mention a funny thing both languages have in common. Nouns are written together, no spaces. This leads to monster words in Dutch like Kindercarnavalsoptochtvoorbereiding werkzaamheden, comitéleden. That's one Dutch word for children's carnival parade preparation committee members. Or in German, they have the word Rindfleischetakierungsüberwachungsaufgabenübertragungsgesetz. That's the German word for a law to delegate monitoring of veal labeling. Just as a side note, you won't find these words in a dictionary as no one normally uses this word. They remain grammatically correct though. That being said, let's move on to grammar. When it concerns articles, Dutch only has two genders. This is still harder than the English with their the, but still much easier than the many different ones German have. There's also one indefinite article, which is easy to remember. In Dutch, it's een. The negative indefinite article is always geen, always. The first gender is the common gender, either masculine or feminine. This group is known as de nouns. For example, de boom. This means the tree. As trees have the masculine gender in Dutch, it's a de noun. The second gender is neuter, known as het nouns. For example, het huis. This means the house. As houses have the neuter gender in Dutch, it is a het noun. There's one exception to nouns not having three genders. This is when referring back to nouns using the possessive. Then gender does play a role. I'll illustrate that with the following example. De raad beslist. Haar beslissing werd goed ontvangen. This literally translates to the council decides. Her decision was well received. Because Dutch only knows two genders, this means that Dutch has no cases. It's always de or het. Even with plural, we simply use de for that. No more der, die, oder, das. Prepositions don't change a single thing. This does make life easier, as Germans sometimes don't even agree amongst themselves what gender should be assigned to a specific word. 
Take the word butter as an example. The southern Bundesländer and much of Switzerland and part of Austria say butter is masculine. The rest of the German-speaking population use it as a feminine word. As Dutch and German have the same ancestor language, this means that Dutch used to have cases, so one can sometimes pop up in old expressions or names. For example, the official name for the Netherlands in Dutch is Koninkrijk der Nederlanden. Translates to Kingdom of the Netherlands. Leaving gender and case behind us, let's talk about another grammatical point. Word order. The basic word order for Dutch and German and a bunch of other languages is subject, verb, object. In Dutch and German, however, we have something peculiar going on. And this is known as the subject, verb, object, verb order in more complex sentences. This is also known as the V2 word order. Let me illustrate this with an example. I am going to learn something about the differences between Dutch and German today. In Dutch that would be Ik ga vandaag wat over de verschillen tussen Nederlands en Duits leren. In German it would be Heute werde ich etwas über den Unterschied zwischen Niederländisch und Deutsch lernen. Those are very long sentences, so I'll break them down to make it easier to understand. In English, all the verbs are at the beginning of the sentence. I am going to learn dot dot dot. In Dutch and German, only the conjugated word gaan in Dutch or werden in German is at the beginning of the sentence. The infinitive leren in Dutch or lernen in German is the, at the end of the sentence. This is something typical of Dutch and German. The exact word order of the V2 position is slightly different between Dutch and German. When it comes to auxiliary verbs, the order in Dutch is auxiliary verb plus infinitive. In German, it's the opposite way around, infinitive plus auxiliary verb. I will illustrate this with an example. This is a television series that one should definitely watch. In Dutch, dit is een televisieserie die men beslist zou moeten kijken. And in German, das is eine TV-serie die man unbedingt anschauen sollte. Note again how in Dutch the correct sentence is moeten kijken and in German it is anschauen sollte. Listen to the dialogue. Wat doe je voor werk? Ik ben een kunstenaar. Listen to it again, now with the English translation. Wat doe je voor werk? What do you do? Ik ben een kunstenaar. I'm an artist. First of all, you need to learn how to say, What do you do? That's... Wat doe je voor werk? Listen to it again. Wat doe je voor werk? Wat doe je voor werk? Now, how do you answer this question? This is the pattern you'll need. Ik ben een... Your occupation. I'm a... An... Your occupation. For example, I'm an artist. Ik ben een kunstenaar. Ik ben een kunstenaar. Here are a few more professions you can use with the same pattern. Police officer. Politieagent. Politieagent. Politieagenten. Politieagenten. Teacher. Leraar. 
Lerar. Lerares. Lerares. Doctor. 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 Engineer. Ingenieur. Ingenieur. Now, listen to some examples. Wat doe je voor werk? Ik ben een leraar. Wat doe je voor werk? Ik ben een dokter. Wat doe je voor werk? Ik ben een ingenieur. Okay, now it's your turn. Do you remember how to say, what do you do? Wat doe je voor werk? Imagine you're a doctor. Do you remember how to say, doctor? Dokter. Dokter. Say, I'm a doctor. Ik ben een dokter. Now answer the question saying that you are a doctor. Wat doe je voor werk? Ik ben een dokter. Now, imagine you're a teacher. Do you remember how to say teacher? Leraar. Leraar. Say, I'm a teacher. Ik ben een leraar. Now, answer the question saying that you are a teacher. Wat doe je voor werk? Ik ben een leraar. Now, imagine you're an engineer. Do you remember how to say engineer? Ingenieur. Ingenieur. Say, I'm an engineer. Ik ben een ingenieur. Now, answer the question saying that you are an engineer. Wat doe je voor werk? Ik ben een ingenieur. Een leraar is aan het praten met zijn leerlingen. Wat gaan de leerlingen meenemen? Morgen gaan we naar het museum. Neem met je mee een pen, een schrift en iets om te drinken. Je hoeft geen boterhammen mee te nemen, want we gaan lunchen in het restaurant van het museum. En een paraplu? Het kan gaan regenen. Neem er alsjeblieft eentje mee. Oké. Okay. Wat gaan de leerlingen meenemen? Een leraar is aan het praten met zijn leerlingen. Wat gaan de leerlingen meenemen? Morgen gaan we naar het museum. Neem met je mee een pen, een schrift en iets om te drinken. Je hoeft geen boterhammen mee te nemen, want we gaan lunchen in het restaurant van het museum. En een paraplu? Het kan gaan regenen. Neem er alsjeblieft eentje mee. Oké. Okay. Een man en een vrouw zijn aan het praten. Wanneer nemen ze een massage? Een vriend van me heeft net een nieuwe massagesalon geopend. Een massagesalon? Daar wil ik heen. Heb je zaterdag tijd? Zaterdag heb ik het druk. Hoe denk je over zondag? De zaak is op zondag dicht. En vrijdag? Oké. Okay. 
Wanneer nemen ze een massage? Een man en een vrouw zijn aan het praten. Wanneer nemen ze een massage? Een vriend van me heeft net een nieuwe massagesalon geopend. Een massagesalon? Daar wil ik heen. Heb je zaterdag tijd? Zaterdag heb ik het druk. Hoe denk je over zondag? De zaak is op zondag dicht. En vrijdag? Oké. Okay. Een vrouw is aan het praten met een winkelbediende. Naar welke verdieping gaat de vrouw? Excuseer, waar bevindt zich de kleding voor vrouwen? Op de derde, vierde en vijfde verdieping. Op welke hangen de jassen? Op de vierde verdieping. De lift bevindt zich daar ginds. Op de vierde verdieping? Dank u wel. Naar welke verdieping gaat de vrouw? Een vrouw is aan het praten met een winkelbediende. Naar welke verdieping gaat de vrouw? Excuseer, waar bevindt zich de kleding voor vrouwen? Op de derde, vierde en vijfde verdieping. Op welke hangen de jassen? Op de vierde verdieping. De lift bevindt zich daar ginds. Op de vierde verdieping? Dank u wel. Een man en een vrouw zijn aan het praten. Waar is de sleutel? Waar is de sleutel van het appartement? Ik heb hem op de tafel achtergelaten. Hij ligt er niet. Probeer eens onder de tafel. Niets. Hmm, hij zit ook niet in mijn zak. Oh, hij zat in mijn tas. Waar is de sleutel? Een man en een vrouw zijn aan het praten. Waar is de sleutel? Waar is de sleutel van het appartement? Ik heb hem op de tafel achtergelaten. Hij ligt er niet. Probeer eens onder de tafel. Niets. Hmm, hij zit ook niet in mijn zak. Oh, hij zat in mijn tas. Een man en een vrouw zijn aan het praten. Wanneer gaat de man schilderen? Schilder je elke dag? Ja, vanaf negen uur s morgens tot zeven uur s avonds. Van negen tot zeven? Dat is tien uur. Ja, inderdaad. Het is mijn werk. Wanneer gaat de man schilderen? Een man en een vrouw zijn aan het praten. Wanneer gaat de man schilderen? Schilder je elke dag? Ja, vanaf negen uur s morgens tot zeven uur s avonds. Van negen tot zeven? Dat is tien uur. Ja, inderdaad. Het is mijn werk. Your condition is not getting better and you decide to go to the nearby clinic. You receive a medical report. What is the diagnosis? You receive a medical report. What is the diagnosis?
the diagnosis is food poisoning caused by contaminated food. Voedselvergiftiging veroorzaakt door besmet voedsel. You just bought a few items from a local shop online. What information does the website say about the delivery date? What information does the website say about the delivery date? The website says that Delivery dates differ depending on the delivery method, but all dates should be calculated from the next working day. Leveringsdata verschillen afhankelijk van de verzendmethode, maar alle data moeten worden berekend vanaf de volgende werkdag. The day after ordering an item online, you receive an email notification. How can you track your package? How can you track your package? The email says that you can track your package on this website by logging into your account, and after logging in, click on your order history and enter the order number found in this email. U kunt uw pakket traceren door in te loggen met uw gegevens op deze website. Na het inloggen, klik op uw bestelgeschiedenis en toets het bestelnummer in wat u in deze e-mail vindt. You're reading the instructions of an electronic device you've just bought. What should you do in case of overheating?
What should you do in case of overheating? The manual says that if you notice the surface overheating, unplug the device immediately and allow it to cool down before handling again. Als u merkt dat de oppervlakte oververhit raakt, ontkoppel het apparaat onmiddellijk en laat het eerst afkoelen alvorens weer te gebruiken. Your reading and event guide and are going to see an upcoming art event. What does the guide say about bringing food to the event? What does the guide say about bringing food to the event? The description reads that if you bring your own food or drinks, they will be confiscated. Zelf meegebrachte consumpties worden in beslag genomen. With your receipt, you also received a coupon. Where do you have to present the coupon? Where do you have to present the coupon? It says, present this coupon at the counter at the time of purchase to receive a 20% discount off all items. Laat deze kortingsbon tijdens de aankoop aan de balie zien en ontvang 20% korting op alle artikelen. Are you afraid of making mistakes in your target language? Afraid you'll never ever be able to have a conversation or give a presentation? Or maybe you're afraid of something else? In this video, we'll cover four fears related to language learning and how to overcome them. The first one is, I'm afraid I'm not good enough to speak. I freeze. Do you feel like you're not good enough to speak yet? A lot of people can relate to this one. Probably all language learners have felt this at some point. It's a pretty common fear. Here are some tips to overcome it. First, speak from day one. The best way to get good at speaking is to practice speaking. If you're holding yourself back because you think you're not good enough, you're making a mistake. That's exactly why you're not improving. You need to open your mouth and start talking. Second, if you're not sure what to say to start speaking, consider practicing with existing dialogues. In our lessons, you get scripts for introducing yourself, making small talk, ordering food, expressing opinions, and much more. If you're looking for some things to use for speaking practice, the lessons will give you the exact lines and conversations. 
Our third tip, learn with your own teacher with our Premium Plus plan. With Premium Plus, you get an actual native speaker teacher to tell you what to say and how to say it. You can actually learn to speak with the help of a real native teacher. Fear number two is, I'm afraid I'll never be fluent. This is a common fear for beginner learners. Once you start improving and seeing progress, this goes away. When you're just starting out with a new language, fluency can feel like an impossible goal. There are so many new things to learn and so many methods you can use. It's easy to get overwhelmed with all the options, but you can't let yourself fall into that trap. The longer you keep at it, the better your language skills will become. And slowly, you'll stop worrying about fluency. What's important is that you put in time and continue working on moving forward. So, how do you overcome worries about never becoming fluent? How do you motivate yourself to continue? First, set small, specific goals instead of just saying, I want to become fluent. How do you know when you've become fluent? Fluency is hard to determine. Instead of creating a vague, hard to understand goal for yourself, focus on working towards smaller goals. For example, set goals like being able to introduce yourself or having a five minute conversation, something you can measure so you'll know when you've reached it. Fluency can be difficult to measure. If you set goals that you can measure, you can track your progress. This helps keep your motivation up over time. The third fear is, I'm afraid I'm not actually learning or making progress. If you're afraid you're not making progress, there are a few things you can do right now. First of all, review. A lot of people hear a new phrase once and think they'll remember it, but that usually doesn't happen. So when they forget what they've learned, they get worried that they're not learning or that the lessons don't work. But the truth is you have to review again and again to truly master something. Second, use the dashboard to track your progress. If numbers and data are helpful for you as you track your learning, check out our dashboard. It tracks your progress and gives you dynamic reports. Third, try a harder lesson on the site. You might not understand it all at first, and that's okay. You'll be able to after some study. All lessons come with line-by-line -line translations and our teachers explain every single word. Break down these harder lessons. If you have to work a little more slowly, it's okay. When you finish the lesson, you can be sure of your progress because you'll be able to understand something you didn't understand a few minutes earlier. Fourth, learn one-on-one -on -one with a teacher with our Premium Plus plan. They will personally review your writing and your speaking and will fix your mistakes. Getting regular feedback from a native speaker is a great way to know if you're making progress. It's such a great feeling to hear a native speaker tell you, wow, you're getting good. The fourth fear is, I'm afraid of not understanding anything I hear. This is very common. You hear advanced grammar and vocabulary and it goes completely over your head. You have no idea what you've just heard. Here are some tips for working on this issue. If you're taking an advanced lesson, read along with the script. Reading along with our line-by-line -line dialogue is the best way to improve your understanding of advanced conversations. If you're in a real-life situation, the solution is quite simple. Learn useful phrases like, excuse me, can you say it again slower? Or, can you say it in simpler words? Or even just, I don't understand. There's nothing wrong with saying that you didn't understand something or asking for help. These are some common fears for most language learners, and we hope these tips help you. Is there anything else that you're afraid of when it comes to learning another language? Let us know in the comments, and maybe we can share some suggestions for how to overcome them. For the tools we've talked about in this video and much more, check out our complete language learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account by clicking on the link in the description. Get tons of resources to have you speaking in your target language. And if you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a new language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. I'll see you next time. Bye! Are you struggling to reach your language learning goals or losing motivation for learning? In this video, we're going to talk about how to reach your goals, how to enjoy the process, and the importance of rewarding yourself. Part 1. How to reach your language goals. It's pretty exciting when you reach a goal. You know your hard work has paid off, and you can see your results. But how do you set goals to ensure you can reach them and get that feeling of satisfaction? 
The best way to see real results and achieve your language learning goals is to set small, measurable goals. Many people make the mistake of setting big, vague goals, like I want to be fluent, or I want to speak a new language. Then they download an app or get a textbook and they try to reach their goal. But they quickly give up because the goal they've set for themselves is too overwhelming. This is why it's important to set small, measurable, monthly or weekly goals from the beginning of your studies. Reaching your goals helps you develop confidence in yourself and your ability to get things done. For example, you might make it a goal to be able to have a one minute conversation by the end of your first month of studies and have a two minute conversation by the end of month two. Maybe after six months, you aim to have a 10 minute conversation with someone. Specific measurable goals like these help you track your progress and prevent you from getting overwhelmed. By creating small goals like these, you set yourself up for success. When you reach one of your goals, even if it's a small one, you feel a sense of accomplishment. This helps you enjoy the learning process, which is the next topic we're going to focus on. Part two, how to enjoy the language learning process. If you're always focused on goals and results though, how do you enjoy the process of learning a language? Okay, so let's say that in addition to larger goals, you've made small realistic goals like learning 100 words in a month. That's three to four words per day. Goals like these are very easy to accomplish, and when you complete them, it feels good. This is one of the enjoyable parts of learning a language. So, imagine accomplishing small goals all throughout your week. It's a great way to keep your motivation up and enjoy the process of learning. Smaller goals can help you stay on track and keep your confidence up. When we feel like we're not making progress, we can get frustrated and lose motivation. Think about days when you're super busy at work or at school. Some days, you might be so busy you don't complete any tasks. When nothing seems to move forward, we can lose confidence in ourselves and feel like quitting. This is why giving yourself some small, easy to accomplish goals can be extremely helpful. You can approach your studies with confidence because you know that you're working towards your next goal and that you can actually achieve it. Here's something you can try if you feel like your progress has slowed down. Go back and review something you studied a few weeks or a few months earlier. Try to remember how difficult it was at first. Looking over past materials can help us understand how much we've grown. The same thing is true for conversations. When you start learning a language, you'll learn things like how to introduce yourself, ask basic questions, and talk about the weather. After a few months of study though, you'll learn how to talk about your hobbies, your neighborhood, or your personality. It's sometimes hard to remember just how much progress we've made, but look back on your work from time to time. All those hours you put in are reflected in your current abilities. It's exciting when you realize how far you've come. Of course, some people might also reflect on mistakes they made, especially if these mistakes led to miscommunications with native speakers. While these memories can be embarrassing, they can still be useful for your studies. Try to shift your mindset towards mistakes. Making an embarrassing mistake can be helpful in the long run because we remember the experience vividly and we want to avoid repeating it. If the mistake wasn't so embarrassing, maybe you can laugh about it and use that memory to ensure you make the right decision in the future. Lastly, we want to remind everyone of the most enjoyable part of the language learning process, the new friends, connections, and experiences you gain through the language. You can use the language you're studying as a tool to create friendships, to meet new people, and to travel. If you ever get to a point where learning isn't fun or interesting anymore, take a moment and consider why. Are you getting overwhelmed? Falling behind on your goals? If your schedule has changed or your goals have changed, that's fine. Adjust your study plan and your study goals to make the learning process work for you. Revise your approach and make sure you're enjoying learning. Part three, the importance of rewards. If you haven't gotten into the practice of rewarding yourself for reaching a goal, now is a great time to start. A reward can be a powerful way to motivate yourself to complete a goal. If your reward is travel or event related, it can also act as a finite deadline. This can push you to focus even more. You can decide to reward yourself with something you buy, with an experience, or maybe just with some time to relax. Choose a reward that will work best for you. Positive reinforcement can be very helpful in the learning process. It's one thing to hit a goal and feel good about it, but if you have a reward too, it seals the deal. It helps you keep the cycle going and will help you keep learning. So today we covered goal setting, how to enjoy the process of learning and the importance of rewards. Make sure you set small measurable goals in addition to your larger goals. Find ways to enjoy the process of studying and make sure to reward yourself for your achievements. 
Learning a language should be fun and satisfying. For some more resources to help you reach your goals, check out our complete language learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account by clicking on the link in the description. Get tons of resources to have you speaking in your target language. And if you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a new language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. I'll see you next time. Bye! Want to speak and understand more of your target language? If so, of course, you'll need to know more words and phrases than you do now. In this video, we'll cover five ways to master new words and phrases fast. Number one, use our free vocabulary list. This is a free library of vocabulary and phrase lessons for all kinds of situations. You can learn words and phrases for current events, holidays like Halloween and Thanksgiving, and useful topics like the top 10 ways to say hello, conversational phrases, and more. You'll learn phrases that you won't find in textbooks. If you want to learn extra fast, use the slideshow tool. Just tap or click on View Slideshow, then sit back and review the words and phrases. Find the vocabulary list in the vocabulary drop-down menu on the site. These vocabulary lists are free for all users. Number two, take the audio and video lessons. One of the best ways to learn new words is by hearing and using them in conversations. This is because it gives you the opportunity to understand how the words are actually used. In every lesson dialogue, you'll likely come across some words you don't know, but don't worry because our teachers translate everything. When you hear the conversation again at the end of the lesson, you'll be familiar with the words you didn't know at first. Number three, learn with our 2000 most common words list. A quick question, how many words do you think you need for conversational fluency? 3000, 5000? It's actually not as many as you think. Language experts say you need about 1,500 words to reach conversational fluency. With our 2,000 most common words list, you'll get access to key vocabulary words you need to boost your conversation skills. The words are broken down into simple categories, such as adjectives, nouns, verbs, food, drinks, numbers, months, and so on. So you can go category by category and focus on what you're most interested in first. With this tip, we're not talking about paper flashcards. We're talking about the smart flashcards that you can find in our premium study tools. This is an automatic system individualized for each member based on their study needs. First, you'll use the cards to check your knowledge. Then, according to your answers, the cards will be sorted according to which words you need more practice with. Words that you struggle with will be shown to you more and more. You'll see words that you know well less often. This system helps you study more efficiently. It displays the words you need to work on and knows when you should refresh your knowledge. This helps make sure you don't forget vocabulary. In every study session, these cards will help you refresh your memory on the words you learned last time and introduce new words. Number five, use the words. After you learn a new word, using it right away is crucial to remembering it. So when you're done with a lesson or a vocab list, here's something you can do. Leave a comment. Make up a sample sentence and post it in the comment section. Write it down in a notebook or shadow the word with a lessons dialogue. Our language learning program is full of tools that can help you speak more. Just pick one and get started. If you wanna unlock all of these study tools, check out our complete language learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account by clicking on the link in the description. Get tons of resources to have you speaking in your target language. And if you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a new language and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. I'll see you next time, bye. Hey everyone, welcome to the monthly review, the monthly show on language learning where you discover new learning strategies, motivational tips, study tools, and resources. By the way, all the lessons and bonuses you're about to see can be downloaded for free on our website. So click the link in the description right now to sign up for your free lifetime account. Okay, today's topic is five ways to make sure you start on the right foot with language learning. Ever wondered if you're on the right path with your language learning or if you're studying the right things and taking the right steps? Well, today you'll learn how to start on the right foot with your language learning journey. We'll talk about one, 
why you must know your reason for learning the language, two, how to set fail-proof goals and rewards, three, how to match your daily routine to your learning so that you don't struggle with the actual learning, four, why you need anchor points for long-term motivation, and five, how to improve faster with ongoing assessment. How to start off on the right foot with your language learning journey. There are five things you, as a language learner, need to address if you want to start off on the right foot. Here they are. One, your reason for learning. Two, your goal and reward. Three, matching your routine to your medium. Four, anchor points. And five, assessment. If you get these squared away in your first month, you'll be set up to succeed with any language goal you set. And today, we'll walk you through each point. The first one, your reason for learning. Why are you learning the language? So why is thinking about your why so important? Here's an example. Think back to when you were a kid and you were trying to save money. What was the first thing you wanted to buy and how much did it cost? You probably still remember what it was and how much it cost. And because you knew the specific price, you were able to save up for it. If not, at the very least, you made more progress than if you just said, I want to save money, with no specific purpose in mind. And that's the thing. If you know precisely why you're doing something, it's easy to tie a goal to it. And there are all kinds of reasons to learn a language. There's travel, family, friends, love, or maybe you're living in a country that speaks it. So knowing your reason clarifies your mission and gives you motivation from the start. Now, some reasons are stronger than others. For example, living in a country that speaks the language is a powerful reason. You need it for survival. If your reason for learning is something simpler, like, I just want to watch TV in that language, it's not exactly something you need to survive. Does it matter whether you have a strong reason or not? Not necessarily. Strong reasons help with motivation initially, but people with strong reasons can and do fail, and people with weak reasons succeed. It's all up to the individual. But the point is, you need to know why you're doing this. And that's enough for you to take the first step. The second point, goals and rewards. Once you've clarified your reason, it's time to set your goals. If you want to succeed, your goal can't just be, I want to be fluent one day. Why? Because this tells you nothing about how you'll achieve it or when you'll reach fluency. It's too vague. Your goal needs to be small, measurable, realistic, and have a deadline, so you can clearly see the steps you need to take to reach your goal. Instead of saying, I want to be fluent one day, which you can't measure and can't precisely determine, aim for, for example, 30 words or one minute of conversation. You can measure these goals. If you have a deadline like by next month, you know your time frame. And unlike a goal like I want to be fluent, a goal like I want to be able to talk for one minute is much more realistic. Now, what about rewards? Now that you've set a goal, you need to tie rewards to your goal. Why rewards? Shouldn't you work hard first and worry about rewards later? Because rewards are powerful motivators, you should be working hard. But hard work often is not fun, and you need something to push you through. When you come home after a long day of work on a rainy day, soaking wet, the last thing you want to do is open a book and start studying. It's so much easier to turn on Netflix or something. But having that reward reminds you, if I achieve this, then I get that. So defining what's in it for me, what do I get, boosts your motivation. You have something to look forward to and get you through times when you don't feel like doing work. The third point is, match your routine to the study medium. Once you have your goals and rewards, you need to fit your language learning into your current life and daily routine. How? Sit down and write out your daily schedule for every day of the week. For example, wake up at 7 a.m., breakfast at 8 a.m., get on the bus at 9 a.m., work from 9.30 a.m., lunch at 1 p.m., and so on. Do this for every day of the week. That way, you can see where you can fit in learning. For example, if you ride the bus in the morning, you can use that time to listen to our audio lessons. Why do this? Well, language learning is a brand new routine. If you don't work from your existing daily routines, it may not work out. For example, if you decide to wake up an hour earlier to study, now you're adding two new routines, waking up earlier and learning a language at once. One is hard enough, but two makes it even harder. You may not wake up on time. You may not get out of bed. You may fall right back to sleep. 
The point here is you should piggyback off of your existing routines and use a learning medium that matches your routine. So instead of waking up earlier, keep your daily routine, but look for another way to introduce language learning. Write out your daily routine, see where you spend your time, and then match your routine to learning. If you take walks and listen to music, swap out music for language lessons and listen along. If you take the bus or train, check out our audio and video lessons. If you usually read in the evenings and can focus, try using a textbook. In all of these examples, you're taking an existing routine and adding language learning inside. The fourth point is set anchor points. Anchor points are the connections you make to a language that boost your motivation and keep you attached or anchored to your goal so you don't slip away. So what's an example of an anchor point? For example, if you have friends or relatives that speak the language, and if you're around them and you're exposed to the language, you're more likely to learn. Same thing with watching TV shows in the target language. You're exposed to it more, so your interest in learning naturally goes up. Also, investing in a textbook or learning program, signing up for classes or for a proficiency test. All of these are anchor points that connect you back to the language. Why do you need anchor points? Oftentimes, your initial reason for learning the language isn't as motivating as it used to be. Maybe you were motivated in month one, but not in month five. That's why people with strong reasons might fail. So an anchor point gives you another reason to keep going and boost your motivation. And also, oftentimes, the reason we start isn't the same as the reason we continue. Anchor points are not something you need to worry about in your first month of learning, but adding them in the second month and afterward will help you keep going. Can you think of any anchor points you can add? Leave a comment. Finally, the fifth point is you need assessment. Now that you have goals, rewards, a routine, and anchor points, it's not enough to learn a language alone in a vacuum. You need feedback and course correction from a native speaker. With our learning program, you can learn with your very own teacher. You can also leave comments on lessons and get answers from the others. Or you can find a tutor of your own someone that will assess your progress and correct you as needed. So, let's recap. There are five things you, as a language learner, need to address if you want to start off on the right foot. One, clarify your reason for learning. Two, set goals and rewards. Three, match your routine with your study medium. Four, set anchor points. And five, get ongoing assessment. So, thank you for watching this episode of Monthly Review. Next time, we'll talk about how to deal with missed language goals and failure. If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. And if you're ready to finally learn language the fast, fun, and easy way, and start speaking from your very first lesson, get our complete learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Click the link in the description. See you next time. Bye. Want to cut your language studying time in half? In this video, you'll discover how learning a language using PDF lessons is convenient, efficient, and can help you cut your studying time nearly in half. Many people give up on their dream of learning a second language because traditional classroom instruction is too much of a hassle. Between getting to class, studying on someone else's schedule, and just the sheer expense of the book's intuition, traditional learning can be tough. Many people simply give up. Online classes are an option, but sometimes limited data plans can derail the dream of learning a new language. Fortunately, there is a solution, learning language using PDF lesson notes. Let's take a closer look at how studying language lessons in PDF format can help you reach your dream in about half the time of normal video or audio lessons. First, print all lessons and PDF tools and take them with you anywhere. Sometimes a tiny smartphone screen just isn't adequate, especially when you're trying to learn something new. The great thing about PDF lessons is that they can be quickly printed and taken anywhere after you download them. In fact, printing out lessons in PDF format can actually save you time when compared to going through the material on a smartphone with a small screen, even with the extra printing time. Second, they're a great study tool to boost retention and mastery. Studying video or audio lessons online is a great way to learn a language because students can play and rewind sections as many times as needed until the lesson is mastered. But when you review the same lessons again in PDF format, an incredible thing happens. Your retention dramatically improves. 
Thanks to time-spaced repetition, seeing the information again in written format helps reinforce the information in your mind and improves both retention and recall. The benefits of learning a language using PDF lessons quickly add up to significant time savings for you, your data plan, and your dream of learning a new language. Third, all lessons in PDF format include in-depth instructor notes. We have thousands of HD video and audio lessons, and each one includes a PDF version with a line-by-line -line transcript, so you can read along with the lesson as it appears online. In addition to the line-by-line -line transcript, all lessons include in-depth instructor notes with more information, sample sentences, explanations, and translations. The additional information and notes help you learn faster and with greater mastery than using the video or audio lessons alone. And when paired with language learning video games, video and audio lessons, or other study aids, our PDF lessons help you reach your dream of learning a new language faster and easier than many traditional classroom settings. Fourth, you can download the world's largest online collection of lessons by real instructors. Planning on going on vacation and don't know if you'll have reliable internet service? If you're learning through PDF lessons, it's not a problem. Once you download lessons in PDF format to your smartphone, PC, or favorite media device, they are yours to use and keep forever. Once downloaded, you can either print out or access your lessons in PDF format, regardless of internet access. When you consistently learn through PDF lessons, the time savings and benefits quickly compound. From quicker access to faster learning, PDF lessons can potentially reduce total study time required to learn a concept. Our PDF lessons include instructor notes and supplemental resources that help you learn faster and with less effort. So, if you're ready to finally learn a new language the fast, fun, and easy way, sign up for your free lifetime account by clicking on the link in the description. Signing up takes less than 30 seconds, and you'll start speaking from your very first lesson. If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a new language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. I'll see you next time. Bye. Are you afraid of making mistakes in your target language? Afraid you'll never ever be able to have a conversation or give a presentation? Or maybe you're afraid of something else. In this video, we'll cover four fears related to language learning and how to overcome them. The first one is, I'm afraid I'm not good enough to speak. I freeze. Do you feel like you're not good enough to speak yet? A lot of people can relate to this one. Probably all language learners have felt this at some point. It's a pretty common fear. Here are some tips to overcome it. First, speak from day one. The best way to get good at speaking is to practice speaking. If you're holding yourself back because you think you're not good enough, you're making a mistake. That's exactly why you're not improving. You need to open your mouth and start talking. Second, if you're not sure what to say to start speaking, consider practicing with existing dialogues. In our lessons, you get scripts for introducing yourself, making small talk, ordering food, expressing opinions, and much more. If you're looking for some things to use for speaking practice, the lessons will give you the exact lines and conversations. Our third tip, learn with your own teacher with our Premium Plus plan. With Premium Plus, you get an actual native speaker teacher to tell you what to say and how to say it. You can actually learn to speak with the help of a real native teacher. Fear number two is, I'm afraid I'll never be fluent. This is a common fear for beginner learners. Once you start improving and seeing progress, this goes away. When you're just starting out with a new language, fluency can feel like an impossible goal. There are so many new things to learn and so many methods you can use. It's easy to get overwhelmed with all the options, but you can't let yourself fall into that trap. The longer you keep at it, the better your language skills will become. And slowly, you'll stop worrying about fluency. What's important is that you put in time and continue working on moving forward. So, how do you overcome worries about never becoming fluent? How do you motivate yourself to continue? First, set small, specific goals instead of just saying, I want to become fluent. How do you know when you've become fluent? Fluency is hard to determine. Instead of creating a vague, hard to understand goal for yourself, focus on working towards smaller goals. For example, set goals like being able to introduce yourself or having a five minute conversation, something you can measure so you'll know when you've reached it. Fluency can be difficult to measure. If you set goals that you can measure, you can track your progress. 
This helps keep your motivation up over time. The third fear is, I'm afraid I'm not actually learning or making progress. If you're afraid you're not making progress, there are a few things you can do right now. First of all, review. A lot of people hear a new phrase once and think they'll remember it, but that usually doesn't happen. So when they forget what they've learned, they get worried that they're not learning or that the lessons don't work. But the truth is you have to review again and again to truly master something. Second, use the dashboard to track your progress. If numbers and data are helpful for you as you track your learning, check out our dashboard. It tracks your progress and gives you dynamic reports. Third, try a harder lesson on the site. You might not understand it all at first, and that's okay. You'll be able to, after some study. All lessons come with line-by-line -line translations, and our teachers explain every single word. Break down these harder lessons. If you have to work a little more slowly, it's okay. When you finish the lesson, you can be sure of your progress, because you'll be able to understand something you didn't understand a few minutes earlier. Fourth. Learn one-on-one -on -one with a teacher with our Premium Plus plan. They will personally review your writing and your speaking and will fix your mistakes. Getting regular feedback from a native speaker is a great way to know if you're making progress. It's such a great feeling to hear a native speaker tell you, wow, you're getting good. The fourth fear is, I'm afraid of not understanding anything I hear. This is very common. You hear advanced grammar and vocabulary and it goes completely over your head. You have no idea what you've just heard. Here are some tips for working on this issue. If you're taking an advanced lesson, read along with the script. Reading along with our line-by-line -line dialogue is the best way to improve your understanding of advanced conversations. If you're in a real-life situation, the solution is quite simple. Learn useful phrases like, excuse me, can you say it again slower? Or, can you say it in simpler words? Or even just, I don't understand. There's nothing wrong with saying that you didn't understand something or asking for help. These are some common fears for most language learners, and we hope these tips help you. Is there anything else that you're afraid of when it comes to learning another language? Let us know in the comments, and maybe we can share some suggestions for how to overcome them. For the tools we've talked about in this video and much more, check out our complete language learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account by clicking on the link in the description. Get tons of resources to have you speaking in your target language. And if you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a new language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. I'll see you next time. Bye. Are you struggling to reach your language learning goals or losing motivation for learning? In this video, we're going to talk about how to reach your goals, how to enjoy the process, and the importance of rewarding yourself. Part one, how to reach your language goals. It's pretty exciting when you reach a goal. You know your hard work has paid off and you can see your results. But how do you set goals to ensure you can reach them and get that feeling of satisfaction? The best way to see real results and achieve your language learning goals is to set small, measurable goals. Many people make the mistake of setting big, vague goals, like I wanna be fluent, or I wanna speak a new language. Then they download an app or get a textbook and they try to reach their goal. But they quickly give up because the goal they've set for themselves is too overwhelming. This is why it's important to set small, measurable, monthly or weekly goals from the beginning of your studies. Reaching your goals helps you develop confidence in yourself and your ability to get things done. For example, you might make it a goal to be able to have a one minute conversation by the end of your first month of studies and have a two minute conversation by the end of month two. Maybe after six months, you aim to have a 10 minute conversation with someone. Specific measurable goals like these help you track your progress and prevent you from getting overwhelmed. By creating small goals like these, you set yourself up for success. When you reach one of your goals, even if it's a small one, you feel a sense of accomplishment. This helps you enjoy the learning process, which is the next topic we're going to focus on. Part two, how to enjoy the language learning process. If you're always focused on goals and results though, how do you enjoy the process of learning a language? Okay, so let's say that in addition to larger goals, you've made small realistic goals like learning 100 words in a month. That's three to four words per day. Goals like these are very easy to accomplish, and when you complete them, it feels good. This is one of the enjoyable parts of learning a language. So, imagine accomplishing small goals all throughout your week. It's a great way to keep your motivation up and enjoy the process of learning. Smaller goals can help you stay on track and keep your confidence up. 
When we feel like we're not making progress, we can get frustrated and lose motivation. Think about days when you're super busy at work or at school. Some days, you might be so busy you don't complete any tasks. When nothing seems to move forward, we can lose confidence in ourselves and feel like quitting. This is why giving yourself some small, easy to accomplish goals can be extremely helpful. You can approach your studies with confidence because you know that you're working towards your next goal and that you can actually achieve it. Here's something you can try if you feel like your progress has slowed down. Go back and review something you studied a few weeks or a few months earlier. Try to remember how difficult it was at first. Looking over past materials can help us understand how much we've grown. The same thing is true for conversations. When you start learning a language, you'll learn things like how to introduce yourself, ask basic questions, and talk about the weather. After a few months of study, though, you'll learn how to talk about your hobbies, your neighborhood, or your personality. It's sometimes hard to remember just how much progress we've made, but look back on your work from time to time. All those hours you put in are reflected in your current abilities. It's exciting when you realize how far you've come. Of course, some people might also reflect on mistakes they made, especially if these mistakes led to miscommunications with native speakers. While these memories can be embarrassing, they can still be useful for your studies. Try to shift your mindset towards mistakes. Making an embarrassing mistake can be helpful in the long run because we remember the experience vividly and we want to avoid repeating it. If the mistake wasn't so embarrassing, maybe you can laugh about it and use that memory to ensure you make the right decision in the future. Lastly, we want to remind everyone of the most enjoyable part of the language learning process, the new friends, connections, and experiences you gain through the language. You can use the language you're studying as a tool to create friendships, to meet new people, and to travel. If you ever get to a point where learning isn't fun or interesting anymore, take a moment and consider why. Are you getting overwhelmed? Falling behind on your goals? If your schedule has changed or your goals have changed, that's fine. Adjust your study plan and your study goals to make the learning process work for you. Revise your approach and make sure you're enjoying learning. Part three, the importance of rewards. If you haven't gotten into the practice of rewarding yourself for reaching a goal, now is a great time to start. A reward can be a powerful way to motivate yourself to complete a goal. If your reward is travel or event related, it can also act as a finite deadline. This can push you to focus even more. You can decide to reward yourself with something you buy, with an experience, or maybe just with some time to relax. Choose a reward that will work best for you. Positive reinforcement can be very helpful in the learning process. It's one thing to hit a goal and feel good about it, but if you have a reward too, it seals the deal. It helps you keep the cycle going and will help you keep learning. So today we covered goal setting, how to enjoy the process of learning, and the importance of rewards. Make sure you set small, measurable goals in addition to your larger goals. Find ways to enjoy the process of studying, and make sure to reward yourself for your achievements. Learning a language should be fun and satisfying. For some more resources to help you reach your goals, check out our complete language learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account by clicking on the link in the description. Get tons of resources to have you speaking in your target language. And if you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a new language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. I'll see you next time. Bye. Want to speak and understand more of your target language? If so, of course, you'll need to know more words and phrases than you do now. In this video, we'll cover five ways to master new words and phrases fast. Number one, use our free vocabulary list. This is a free library of vocabulary and phrase lessons for all kinds of situations. You can learn words and phrases for current events, holidays like Halloween and Thanksgiving, and useful topics like the top 10 ways to say hello, conversational phrases, and more. You'll learn phrases that you won't find in textbooks. If you want to learn extra fast, use the slideshow tool. Just tap or click on View Slideshow, then sit back and review the words and phrases. Find the vocabulary list in the vocabulary drop-down menu on the site. These vocabulary lists are free for all users. Number two, take the audio and video lessons. One of the best ways to learn new words is by hearing and using them in conversations. This is because it gives you the opportunity to understand how the words are actually used. In every lesson dialogue, you'll likely come across some words you don't know, but don't worry because our teachers translate everything. 
When you hear the conversation again at the end of the lesson, you'll be familiar with the words you didn't know at first. Number three, learn with our 2,000 most common words list. A quick question. How many words do you think you need for conversational fluency? 3,000? 5,000? It's actually not as many as you think. Language experts say you need about 1,500 words to reach conversational fluency. With our 2,000 most common words list, you'll get access to key vocabulary words you need to boost your conversation skills. The words are broken down into simple categories, such as adjectives, nouns, verbs, food, drinks, numbers, months, and so on. So you can go category by category and focus on what you're most interested in first. With this tip, we're not talking about paper flashcards. We're talking about the smart flashcards that you can find in our premium study tools. This is an automatic system individualized for each member based on their study needs. First, you'll use the cards to check your knowledge. Then, according to your answers, the cards will be sorted according to which words you need more practice with. Words that you struggle with will be shown to you more and more. You'll see words that you know well less often. This system helps you study more efficiently. It displays the words you need to work on and knows when you should refresh your knowledge. This helps make sure you don't forget vocabulary. In every study session, these cards will help you refresh your memory on the words you learned last time and introduce new words. Number five, use the words. After you learn a new word, using it right away is crucial to remembering it. So when you're done with a lesson or a vocab list, here's something you can do. Leave a comment. Make up a sample sentence and post it in the comment section. Write it down in a notebook or shadow the word with a lessons dialog. Our language learning program is full of tools that can help you speak more. Just pick one and get started. If you wanna unlock all of these study tools, check out our complete language learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account by clicking on the link in the description. Get tons of resources to have you speaking in your target language. And if you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a new language and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. I'll see you next time, bye. Hey everyone, welcome to the monthly review, the monthly show on language learning. Where you discover new learning strategies, motivational tips, study tools and resources. By the way, all the lessons and bonuses you're about to see can be downloaded for free on our website. So click the link in the description right now to sign up for your free lifetime account. Okay, today's topic is how to deal with missed language goals and failure. Have you ever failed to reach a goal? If you're planning on learning a language as your 2021 New Year's resolution, or if you just want to know how to get back up and recover from language learning failure, then you'll like this episode. So keep watching. But first, here are this month's new free lessons and resources. First, the Making Mistakes Conversation Cheat Sheet. Do you know how to respond to mistakes in conversations? This brand new cheat sheet will teach you all the must know phrases for correcting others and asking for corrections. Download it for free right now. Second, the 400 Everyday Phrases for Beginners ebook. This bonus ebook will teach you over 400 words and phrases related to daily activities like waking up, making breakfast, going to work or school, and much more. Third, the Shops Around the City vocab lesson. Learn how to say mall, supermarket, restaurant, bakery, and much more with this quick vocabulary bonus. Fourth, do you know how to express holiday greetings in your target language? Access this one minute lesson to learn phrases like happy holidays and have a happy new year. Fifth, must know winter clothing vocab. Do you know how to say jacket or scarf in your target language? If you don't, then this next one minute lesson will give you all the words you need for winter clothing. To get your free resources, click the link in the description below right now. They're yours to keep forever. Okay, let's jump into today's topic. How to deal with missed language goals and failure. If you've ever set a goal, you've probably dealt with failure. A lot of people set goals around January when they set their New Year's resolutions. If you're planning on setting a resolution to learn a new language in 2021, you'll want to pay attention. 
Now, in this video, when we say failure, we mean you set a goal, but you don't reach it. For example, if the goal was learning 100 words in a month, either you learned some words, meaning you took some steps, or you did nothing at all, meaning you learned zero words. Failure usually happens for one of two reasons. One, you set an unrealistic goal that's too hard for you or your routine or your lifestyle. For example, learning 1,000 words in a month can be overwhelming. Or two, it could be for reasons outside of your control. Maybe you got sick, or you're busy at work and have no time, or you're moving. Life can get in the way. So how do you deal with failure? Do you feel disappointed? Do you quit? Do you keep trying? Leave us a comment and let us know. But if you want to succeed with your future language goals, you'll need to change your outlook on failure and learn how to recover. So here are five ways to deal with missed goals. One, ask yourself, is this outside of my control or inside of my control? For example, you could be moving, you might have overtime at work, you may get sick, and life might just get in the way. These situations are outside of your control, so there's no need to blame yourself. If they were inside your control, it's likely you set a goal that was too hard or simply unrealistic for your current lifestyle. Why ask this? If the situation is outside of your control, you should keep on going. If the situation is within your control, you can work on fixing it, and we'll tell you how in just a bit. Second, if you feel disappointed about a missed goal, which is normal, use that feeling as motivation. Don't stop your language learning journey just because you're feeling disappointed. Third, understand that this isn't the last time you're going to fail. There'll be goals that you'll hit, and there'll be goals that you miss. That's just a fact of life. And in a way, that's good news, because you'll get used to failing. You'll learn not to feel too bad about it, and you'll learn how to keep on going. Fourth, understand that as long as you spend time on the language, that's good enough. Goals are also meant to get you moving in a certain direction. So as long as you made some strides in the right direction, that's better than nothing. So if your goal was to learn 100 words, but you learned only 20, 20 is better than zero. You still started moving in the right direction. And if you didn't reach 100 this time, you can hit 100 in the future. It's just a matter of time. Fifth, recover from failure by setting smaller goals. Why set smaller goals? If you failed to learn 100 words, wouldn't it make sense to try that goal again? Or double up, punish yourself, and learn 200 to make up for lost time? In schools, when we miss homework, we have to make it up and stay on track with new homework. This doesn't make sense with goals. The reason is, if you fail again, it's because that goal is too far out of your reach. Either you yourself can't handle it or your current situation, like being busy at work or having a private matter, doesn't give you much time. By aiming lower, you can at least get back on track to succeeding at reaching a goal. You're getting something done and you're getting your confidence back up. Because if you couldn't reach 100 words last time, chances are you won't reach it this time. So try 50 words, 30 words. Give yourself a chance to succeed on your own terms. And that's it. Don't let the small failures keep you from making a big success. Make your goals work for you. Let's recap one more time. One, ask yourself, is this outside of my control or inside of my control? Two, if you feel disappointed, use that feeling as motivation. Three, understand that this isn't the last time you're going to fail. Four, understand that as long as you spend time on the language, that's good enough. And five, recover from failure by setting smaller goals. If you're planning on setting a language learning resolution for 2021, let us know what it is. Leave a comment. So thank you for watching this episode of Monthly Review. Next time, we'll talk about how to get back on track after language learning failure. If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. And if you're ready to finally learn language the fast, fun, and easy way, and start speaking from your very first lesson, get our complete learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Click the link in the description. See you next time. Bye. What are the best ways to learn a language on the go? You might be surprised to find there are lots of moments throughout the day we can transform into language learning opportunities. These might be on your commute, during an exercise session, or even just when you're trying to kill some time. In this video, we'll introduce you to three tips for learning on the go. Number one, how to learn a language on the go. 
Many of us are probably used to studying when we have time to sit down and concentrate. We take out textbooks and notepads and prepare to focus our attention for an hour or so, like in a classroom. It might be hard to think of studying in other settings, like when you're sitting on a bus or are stuck in traffic, but there are still things you can do, even if your hands are full. For example, think about your commute. How much time do you spend traveling to and from work, school, or other activities throughout the week? If you have a one-hour commute every day, that's a lot of time you could be spending working on your language skills. Even if you're not ready to devote your whole commute to study, a little bit every day will help. But how do you study in environments like these? By changing the way you approach your learning. These days, many people now have a computer right in their pocket. Smartphones make it easy to access many different kinds of study materials. Depending on our needs and the time we have available, we can watch YouTube videos, listen to podcasts, study vocabulary, review infographics, and more. There are many different ways to build our language skills, and we can choose study methods that work for our schedules, our personalities, and our goals. There are a lot of different methods to consider. So in part two, we're going to share a few ideas to help you get started. Number two, five easy ways to learn a language on the go. If you're standing on a crowded train, you can't pull out a book or do workbook problems. If you're exercising, it's probably impossible to review textbooks or take notes. If you're driving, you need to make sure you're watching the road. So how do you transform times like these into study opportunities? Situations like these are great for audio and video lessons. We have huge libraries of both, so you can choose whichever is best for you. All you need to study is a smartphone, a lesson, and a pair of earphones. Just press play and watch a video or listen to an audio lesson, like you would with music. During your commute or exercise session, you'll hear a simple conversation focused on a specific goal, like introducing yourself or ordering food. Then, our teachers will explain the words and phrases. In just a few minutes, you'll be working on mastering an entire conversation. Our second study method suggestion is our app, Innovative Language 101. You can download it for free for the iPhone, iPad, and Android. This will allow you to take your lessons with you wherever you go. Study idea three is for those of you who want something super quick and easy. You can use it to kick off your studies each day. It's our word of the day email. Every day, you get an email with a new word, example sentences, audio, and a picture to help make it stick in your mind. If you check your email during your commute, you can also check the word of the day. Our last two study method ideas are about tools that can help you remember what you study. First is our vocab slideshow tool. This study tool is available on all vocab lists and lessons. Just press play and listen to words and phrases one by one. You can even set the slideshow on a loop and listen to the words over and over. Finally, our last suggestion is our smart flashcards. These flashcards use spaced repetition to help you study and remember words, and the cards are mobile friendly. The cards remember your progress and quiz you on words at the right times. This helps ensure you don't forget the things you study. To access these, visit the site on your phone and find the flashcards in the vocabulary menu. Swipe through as you study. Our system will remember your progress. If you get a word wrong, you'll see it more often. The flashcards know to quiz you again and again until you remember that word. Number three, be consistent. If you can find new ways to use your time and work towards your language goals, great. But remember to be consistent. Using all or even part of your commute or your downtime to study can be a fantastic way to make progress, but you need to make sure to do it regularly. Try to build a habit of starting a video lesson as soon as your commute begins, or pressing play on an audio lesson as soon as you begin a jog. Creating these habits will help you stick with your study methods long-term and will lead to greater progress. When you decide to learn a language, it's exciting, but there are lots of different ways to approach your studies. What can you do to make sure you start things off in the best way for yourself? In this video, we'll cover six things for you to consider to get you started on the right foot. First, what is your reason for learning? Thinking about your why for studying a language can be so important. If you know why you're doing something, it becomes easier to create goals. There are lots of reasons to learn a language. Travel, family, friends, love, and even the experience of living in a new country. Clarifying your reason for learning helps you define your mission and gives you motivation right from the start. Some reasons for learning may be stronger than others. If you live in a country that speaks the language you need to learn, you're probably highly motivated to study because your progress will directly affect your daily life and relationships. 
If, however, your reason for learning is something like, I want to be able to watch TV shows in that language, your motivation might not be as high as the person in the first example, but that's okay. Everyone has a different, unique reason for wanting to learn a language. Take some time to understand what you want to get out of your studies. This is a helpful first step. Second, set the right goals. Once you've clarified your reason for learning, it's time to set your goals. Don't make goals like, I want to be fluent one day. This type of goal is problematic because there's no deadline for the goal, no clues about how you'll achieve your goal, and no way of knowing when you've reached fluency. Your goals need to be small, measurable, realistic, and have a deadline. Try making monthly goals instead of yearly goals. Saying, I want to be fluent one day, isn't helpful. Instead, make a goal like, be able to speak for one minute by the end of the month. A goal like this gives you a target, a skill to develop, and a deadline. You have one month to practice your speaking skills enough to be able to talk for one minute. You can set a timer and track how long you're able to speak. This is also a realistic goal. Learning enough to speak for one minute in one month is reasonable. You can even think of how you might reward yourself for achieving the goal. Third, reward yourself for achieving your goals. You can determine your rewards when you determine your goals. Rewards are powerful motivators. You should be working consistently towards your goals, but there will undoubtedly be times when the work isn't fun and you need something to push you through. When you come home after a long day of work or school on a rainy day, maybe the last thing you want to do is open a book and start studying. It's so much easier to turn on Netflix or scroll social media, but if you have a reward, you can use it as a motivator. As mentioned before, it's important to remember why you're learning a language and what your goals are. For many people, thinking about the rewards they'll get along the way boosts their motivation. If you give yourself something to look forward to, it can help you get through the times you may not feel like putting in the work. Fourth, match your routine to the study medium. The word routine here refers to your everyday routine. You need to understand your personal schedule and your personality to make a study schedule that's right for you. It may come as a surprise that this is a step where many people fail. They think they can do a lot more than they actually can, get overwhelmed, and quit. In the end, the people who give up after just a few weeks of hard study are only able to do a fraction of what they plan to be able to do. It can be tough to understand your own limitations. We all like to think we're capable of doing anything we put our minds to, at any time, on any day. But the reality is, there will be times when we're tired, bored, or just don't feel like studying. We need to be able to plan for times like these. To do that, we need to understand our own limitations. Try this. Write out your weekly schedule. Where do you have some existing time that you can spend on studies? For example, maybe you have some time on your commute every day, or some time during a lunch break. If you're super busy, like most people, look for places in your day that naturally make sense, instead of trying to create a whole new block of time to devote to your studies. Maybe it's when you visit a cafe, or when you're on the bus or train. See if there's a place where you can match the medium, the learning method, to your existing routine. For example, on your commute in the morning, you can listen to an audio lesson twice a week, or listen once a week after dinner at home while you do chores. Break out some vocabulary flashcards during lunchtime. Maybe you can even find a weekend class. Which brings us to our fifth point. Fifth, anchor points. These are the connections you make to a language that boost your motivation and keep you attached or anchored to your goal. For example, maybe you have friends or relatives that speak the language. And if you're around them and you're exposed to the language, you're more likely to learn. If you don't know anyone who speaks the language, consider making a monetary investment, like a textbook or a learning program. By paying for something, you make a commitment to yourself to use it. Sixth, assessment. It's good to know where you are in your studies and determine if you're making progress. If you're not moving forward, maybe the methods you're using aren't quite right for you. Or maybe you need to find new ways to add studying into your routine to give you more opportunities to learn. But don't do assessments so often that you don't actually have a chance to learn. For example, if you take a test once and get a score you're not happy with, don't immediately take the test again. Give yourself time to study and develop your skills more. Then you can come back and try again. Assessment is a great way to keep yourself on track, but don't let tests take over your studies. In this video, we talked about six things to consider when you start learning a language. 
figure out your reason for learning, set good goals, and choose rewards. Have anchor points and make sure to match your routine with the medium of study. And finally, make sure you have the proper approach to assessment of your progress. What was the last new word or phrase you learned? Do you remember? If you can answer this question, then you're using a very important skill for language learning. It's called active recall. Keep watching to learn more about how powerful it is. In this video, we'll cover the best ways to study and remember. So, what is active recall? Active recall is an important part of learning and actually remembering what you've learned. Essentially, it means forcing yourself to remember what you've learned. For example, let's say you're reading a textbook and you learn a new word like hello. Reading is a passive activity. That word or phrase won't last very long in your memory. But then if you ask yourself later, okay, what was that word again? You're using active recall. It's when you try to remember something without looking at the answer. So what's special about this? Typically, when we study for tests, we read and reread textbooks, take notes, highlight some key points, and reread some more. But with this style of studying, you're still looking at the answers and simply reviewing them, right? It's essential that you also study by forcing yourself to remember. Doing this helps improve your memory. So how do we apply this to language learning? What are some tricks that you can use to actually remember what you study? First, try using quick recall. Let's start simple. Tell us in the comments, what was the last word or phrase you learned in your target language? Second, quiz yourself right after studying. After you finish a lesson, ask yourself, what did I learn in this lesson? Go ahead and write down as much as you can remember. You can also ask yourself, what grammar rule did I learn here? Or what was the conversation? And try and recall the dialogue. Do this for every lesson, but don't look at the answers. The point is to recall as much as you can. Third, take notes from memory. Again, don't look at the answers. There's a note feature in each of our lessons to help you do just that. Fourth, take lesson quizzes. You'll find these in each of our lessons. Actually, taking tests or quizzes is a great way to practice active recall since you're forced to remember just the answers. Fifth, use spaced repetition flashcards to master words and phrases. Spaced repetition flashcards quiz you on words and you have to mark whether you know them or you don't. If you know the word, you'll see it again in a few days. And if you don't know a word, you can flip the card and get the answer, but you'll get quizzed on it again and again until you get it right. Six, do assignments. If you're a Premium Plus user, you get weekly assignments from your teacher, and these test you on listening, reading, speaking, and writing. These are all ways to use active recall throughout your language learning to make sure you remember everything you study. Great work, here's a reward. Speed up your language learning with our PDF lessons. Get all of our best PDF cheat sheets and eBooks for free. Just click the link in the description. Great work, here's a reward. Speed up your language learning with our PDF lessons. Get all of our best PDF cheat sheets and eBooks for free. Just click the link in the description.